Hello, BookTube, and welcome back to a series of videos in which I am reading you a book. We are reading Jane Austen's Pride and Prejudice for Jane Austen July, which has only a few days left in it. But we're going to keep going. We're going to keep reading Pride and Prejudice. And uh, things have not gone well for our heroine, Elizabeth Bennet. <laughs> not at all. Uh, they seem to, at first. She made the acquaintance of a very, very dashing young man named Mr. Wickham. I uh, heard his, hob his sob story about how Mr. Darcy, who she already was inclined to dislike, had really done him wrong in their shared life together. Uh, and that was giving her the twin satisfactions of infatuation with a pretty young boy and moral righteousness over someone she thought she didn't like. She carries both of those things to the Netherfield Ball, only to learn that not only is Mr. Wickham not there, but that a couple of play, a couple of points in the ball are going to check her moral indignation. Uh, the sister of Mr. Bingley, the, the new lesser of Netherfield Hall, assures her that if Mr. Wickham has told her a story in which Darcy is the villain, it's a lie. And Jane hears it, and she ought to hear where it comes from. She, she doesn't hear it fully. She hears the facts, and she immediately thinks, well, you're an interested party. You're the sister of Darcy's friend. So, of course you're going to do this. If she were really listening from 30,000 feet, she would give that story a lot more credence, because it's Miss Bingley defending Darcy to someone who Miss Bingley would like to hate Darcy. Uh, it's... It, it seems to come from a sincere place, which is why, when Elizabeth rebuffs it, uh, Miss Bingley ends the conversation in a kind of icy reserve. Not her usual sarcastic twittering, but a kind of icy reserve, telling Elizabeth, well, I meant this in earnest. I had good intentions. But Elizabeth doesn't hear it, and she also goes to her sister Jane, whose moral compass on people is usually infallible, and Jane also says, well, from what I've heard, I don't know any more than you do, but from what I've heard, he doesn't seem like a young man of repute. Doesn't matter to Elizabeth. So that, but that's bad. And on top of that, at the Netherfield Ball, her family embarrasses her. Her mother talks a little too loudly about all of the matrimonial plans for Jane and Miss Bingham and Miss, uh, Mr. Bingley. Uh, her sister Mary makes a fool of herself singing poorly. The family lingers. After everyone else is gone, they hang around for a quarter of an hour when it's obvious that their hosts want them to leave. Uh, and things get worse, because soon after the ball, uh, Mr. Collins, the oily would-be inheritor of Longbourn, the Bennett family home, proposes to her. He proposes marriage to her. And he does so in a horrible way, <laughs> just a horribly lead-footed way. It just gets worse the more he insists on it. She, when he proposes, she tells him, no. My answer is no. I'm honored, but I decline. And he doesn't believe her. <laughs> he doesn't believe her. He's heard too much about the romance novels that young ladies like so much. He thinks, well, I know how this goes. You refuse me, but you don't really mean to refuse me. You're just playing hard to get. Uh, you can't help but wonder, when he is so ready with that defense, whether or not he has tried this in his own hometown and been shot down. He says there are a number of amiable women in his town. Uh, he says that he is proposing to one of the Bennett girls in order to ease the blow of them losing their home when their father dies. If one of them is the mistress of the home, that will make things a little easier. It will be the, it's the only way, really, to keep the property in the family, at least a little. Uh, but we, <laughs> He also thinks that because, I, it, he doesn't say this, but it's obvious that he thinks that because of that connection, another benefit is that one of the Bennett girls certainly can't say no. And Elizabeth does, repeatedly, until finally she just leaves the room. Until finally she says to him, well, I've told you blankly no over and over again. If that's not enough to convince you that my answer is no, I don't know what more I can do. And she leaves the room. Uh, and now we get to chapter 20, because of course, that's not where things are going to stay. <laughs> the, the, because... Yes, Mr. Collins wants uh, a beautiful wife that Lady Catherine de Bourgh, his patron, has suggested that he get one. Uh, and he, I think, uh, whatever amiability we can ascribe to him, I think he really does want to make things a little easier on the Bennett family. He mustn't like the idea of being a villain. 
of turning a mother and five daughters out on the street as soon as he comes into his inheritance. Uh, but he's not the only interested party because Mrs. Bennett desperately wants to marry off her daughters. She desperately wants them settled in life before her father, their father dies because she doesn't have enough money to maintain a household with dependents. She might be able to live on her own maybe in an apartment above an apothecary in town, but she can't support all of her unmarried daughters, and she knows that. She knows that, in other words, if, if she doesn't succeed in getting them married, uh, then Mr. Bennett will die. They'll all be turned out of Longbourn, and then what? They don't have any schooling. As, as uh, Elizabeth is going to say later on in the book, they haven't been schooled at all. They haven't been trained in any way. So what are they going to do? Uh, they'll be completely destroyed by that. And Mrs. Bennett knows that. She has her eye clearly on the prize the whole time. And so she absolutely does not want Elizabeth's no to stand. <laughs> and that brings us to chapter 20. Uh, Mr. Collins was not left long to the silent contemplation of his successful love. For Mrs. Bennett, having dawdled about in the vestibule to watch for the end of the conference, no sooner saw Elizabeth open the door and with quick step pass her towards the staircase than she entered the breakfast room and congratulated both him and herself in warm terms on the happy prospect of their nearer connection. Mr. Collins received and returned these felicitations with equal pleasure and then proceeded to relate the particulars of their interview, with the result of which he trusted he had every reason to be satisfied, since the refusal which his cousin had steadfastly given him would naturally flow from, flow from her bashful modesty and the genuine delicacy of her character. Mrs. Bennet knows Elizabeth better than that. <laughs> uh, this information, however, startled Mrs. Bennet. She would have been glad to be equally satisfied that her daughter had meant to encourage him by protesting against his proposals, but she dared not to believe it, and could not help saying so. But depend upon it, Mr. Collins, she added, that Lizzie shall be brought to reason. I will speak to her about it myself directly. She is very headstrong, foolish girl, and does not know her own interests, but I will make her know it. "'Pardon me for interrupting you, madam,' cried Mr. Collins, "'but if she really if she really is headstrong and foolish, "'I know not whether she would altogether be a very desirable wife "'to a man in my situation, "'who naturally looks for happiness in the marriage state. "'If, if therefore she actually persists in rejecting my suit, "'perhaps it were better not to force her into accepting me, "'because if liable to such defects of temper, "'she could not contribute much to my felicity.' So not wanting to marry, marry Mr. Collins is a defect now. <laughs> Sir, you quite misunderstand me, said Mrs. Bennet, alarmed. Lizzie is only headstrong in such matters as these. We know that's not true, and Mrs. Bennet knows that not, that's not true. She just said too much, that's all. In everything else, she is as good-natured a girl as ever lived. I will go directly to Mr. Bennet, and we shall very soon settle it with her, I am sure. She would not give him time to reply, but hurrying instantly to her husband, called out as she entered the library where you can always find Mr. Bennet. He holds himself up in the library and reads all day. Uh, oh, Mr. Bennet, you are wanted immediately. You are all in an uproar. You must come to make Lizzie marry Mr. Collins, for she vows she will not have him, and if you do not make her haste, he will change his mind and not have her. Mr. Bennet raised his eyes from his book as she entered and fixed them on her face with a calm unconcern which was not in the least altered by her communication. I have not the pleasure of understanding you, said he, when she had finished her, speak, her speech. Of what are you talking? <laughs> friends of mine, years and years ago, friends and I, of mine and I got into the habit of using that phraseology whenever we, whenever we confused or we thought that or we weren't, weren't understanding each other or something, some story or some request. We would say, I have not the pleasure of understanding you. <laughs> uh, of Mr. Collins and Lizzie. Lizzie declares she will not have Mr. Collins, and Mr. Collins begins to say that he will not have Lizzie. And what am I to do on the occasion? It seems an, a hopeless business. Speak to Lizzie about it yourself. Tell her that you insist on her marrying him. Let her be called down. She shall hear my opinion. Mrs. Bennet rang the bell, and Miss Elizabeth was summoned to the library. Come here, child, cried her father as she appeared. I have sent for you on an, an affair of importance. I understand that Mr. Collins has made you an offer of marriage. Is it true? Elizabeth replied that it was. Very well. And this offer of marriage you have refused? I have, sir. Very well. We now come to the point. Your mother insists upon you accepting it. Is that not so, Mrs. Bennet? Yes, or I will never see her again. An unhappy alternative is before you, Elizabeth. 
From this day, you must be a stranger to one of your parents. Your mother will never see you again if you do not marry Mr. Collins, and I will never see you again if you do. Elizabeth could not but smile at such a conclusion of such a beginning. And, but Mrs. Bennet, who had, been, who had persuaded herself that her husband regarded the affair as she wished, was excessively disappointed. What do you mean, Mr. Bennet, by talking in this way? You promised me to insist upon her marrying him. My dear, replied her husband, I have two small favors to request. First, that you will allow me the free use of my understanding on the present occasion, and secondly, of my room. I shall be glad to have the library to myself, as soon as may be. Uh, not yet, however, in spite of her disappointment in her husband, did Mrs. Bennet give up the point. She talked to Elizabeth again and again, coaxed and threatened her by turns. She endeavored to secure Jane in her interest, but Jane, with all possible mildness, declined interfering. And Elizabeth, sometimes with real earnestness and sometimes with playful gaiety, replied to her attacks. Though her manner varied, however, her determination never did. Mr. Collins, meanwhile, was meditating in solitude on what had passed. He thought too well of himself to comprehend on what motive his cousin could refuse him, and though his pride was hurt, he suffered in no other way. His regard for her was quite imaginary, and the possibility of her deserving her mother's reproach prevented his feelings any regret. We're told that he meditated in solitude. Uh, but Longbourn isn't that big, and Mrs. Bennet isn't that discreet. It is, I think, 100% certain that from his room he could hear a lot of the, of the argument that was going on. I doubt very much that in all those efforts of Mrs. Bennet to convince Elizabeth, she kept her voice down. I doubt that very much. So Mr. Collins has probably heard a lot more, which might account for the way his mind starts to change off stage, as it were. Uh, while the family were in this confusion, Charlotte Lucas came to spend the day with them. She was met in the vestibule by Lydia, who, flying to her, cried in half a whisper, I am glad you are come, for there is such fun here. <laughs> what do you think that has happened this morning? Mr. Collins has made an offer to Lizzie, and she will not have him. Charlotte had hardly time to answer before they were joined by Kitty, who came to tell the same news, and no sooner had they entered the breakfast room where Mrs. Bennet was alone than she likewise began, began on the subject, calling on Miss Lucas for her compassion and entreating her to persuade her friend Lizzie to comply with the wishes of all her family. "'Pray do, my dear Miss Lucas,' she added in a melancholy tone, "'for nobody is on my side. Nobody takes part with me. I am cruelly used. Nobody feels for my poor nerves.' Charlotte's reply was spared by the entrance of Jane and Elizabeth. "'Aye, there she comes,' continued Mrs. Bennet, "'looking as unconcerned as may be, and caring no more for us than we were at York, "'provided she can have her own way. "'But I tell you what, Miss Lizzie, if you take it to your head "'to go on refusing every marriage in, your, in this way, "'you will never get a husband at all. "'And I am sure I do not know who is to maintain you when your father is dead. "'I shall not be able to keep you, and so I warn you. "'I have done with you from this very day.' I told you in the library, you know, that I should never speak to you again, and you will find me as good as my word. I have no pleasure in talking to undutiful children. Not that I have much pleasure, indeed, in talking to anybody. People who suffer as much as I do from nervous complaints can have no great inclination for talking. <laughs> okay, she's funny. Okay, all right. <laughs> Nobody can tell you what I suffer. But it is always so. Those who do not complain are never pitied. <laughs> okay, all right. The narrator, Jane Austen, has a great deal of comic aplomb here. This is, this is expertly done. Uh, although her point is correct. If, if you keep acting like this, you'll never have a husband, and I can't support you. So you'll have to work when Mr. Bennett dies. You'll have to work as a governess or something, a seamstress or something. It's beyond your comprehension. And that is true. Elizabeth actually has no idea the miserable life she's that she's toying with she actually doesn't know anything about it i'm sure that she has never spoken five words to any of the servants at longbourn uh, and also I, I know i'm being a little bit a little bit wishful here a little bit maybe paranoid story paranoid but what's that mention about if you keep on refusing every offer of marriage in this way we know that jane has had an offer of marriage before has elizabeth is there a story there? Maybe not. Uh, anyway, uh, her daughters listened in silence to this effusion, sensible that any attempt to reason with or soothe her would only increase the irritation. She talked on, therefore, without interruption from any of them till they were joined by Mr. Collins, who entered with an air more stately than usual, and on perceiving whom, said to the girls, Now I do insist upon it, all of you, all of you, hold your tongues and let Mr. Collins and me have a little conversation together. 
Elizabeth passed quietly out of the room. Jane and Kitty followed, but Lydia stood her ground, determined to hear all she could, and Charlotte, detained first by the civility of Mr. Collins, whose inquiries after herself and all her family were very minute, and then by a little curiosity, satisfied herself with walking to the window and pretending not to hear. In a doleful voice, Mrs. Bennet thus began in projected conversation, Oh, Mr. Collins. My dear madam, replied he, let us be forever silent on this point. Far be it from me, he said, he presently continued in a voice that marked his displeasure, to resent the behavior of your daughter. Resignation to inevitable evils is the duty of us all. The peculiar duty of a young man who has been so fortunate as I have early in early preferment, and I trust, and I trust I am resigned. Perhaps not the less so from feeling a doubt of my positive happiness had my fair cousin honored me with her hand. For I have often observed that resignation is never so perfect as when the blessing denied begins to lose somewhat of its value in our estimation. I'm telling you, he'd have made a perfect match for Mary. Uh, you will not, I hope, consider me as showing any disrespect to your family, my dear madam, by thus withdrawing my pretensions to your daughter's favor, without having paid yourself and Mr. Bennet the compliment of requesting you to interpose your authority in my behalf. He has certainly overheard a lot. Certainly, his mind has completely changed. He has certainly overheard a lot. My conduct may, I fear, be objectionable in having accepted my dismissal from your daughter's lips instead of your own, but we are all liable to error. I have certainly meant well through the whole affair. My object has been to secure an amiable companion for myself with due consideration for the advantage of all your family. And if my manner has been at all reprehensible, I here beg leave to apologize. So that's the end of the chapter, and it ends with Mr. Collins showing a little self-awareness. Tiny bit, not much, but a tiny bit of self-awareness. And also by formally ending his suit. So he went from being congratulating him, himself in solitude over the, the success of his lovemaking to going to the mother of the prospective bride and saying, I no longer offer. That's a big change. And we don't see that happen. So I think it's because he overheard the row that was being caused in the house. I mean, how could you not? Uh, it, it's Longbourn is big, but it's not that big. I, trust me. <laughs> trust me. I have been in quite sizable country estates in England. And when the wind is in the right quarter, you can hear everything everywhere. <laughs> so, uh, but whether it's that or whether he's just been thinking about it or maybe mulling on Mrs. Bennett's own words about Elizabeth, he has withdrawn his suit. So she can't change her mind now. So that's the big import of this chapter is that Elizabeth caused a row. Her father was definitely on her side. The sisters don't care. Jane will not commit. Uh, and that was enough for Mr. Collins. So he is no longer pressing his suit and doesn't seem all that interested in, in considering any of the other Bennett girls. It's just Jane or Elizabeth. He starts out wanting Jane and then Elizabeth. And I don't know quite why. Is it that they're too young or is it that they aren't anywhere near as pretty as Jane or Elizabeth? Or maybe their personalities. <laughs> it could be that. Uh, but anyway, that's our chapter for now. Uh, where is this going to go? Oh, my. <laughs> the, the fat is in the fire. So we will see what happens next time. And I will see you all then. Thank you, Booktube.